A very warm welcome to the fourth and final seminar in our Westminster Abbey Advent series, A Great and Mighty Wonder. These contemplative seminars for Advent have been in part enabled by the generosity of the National Gallery in sharing four images for us to, to consider over these Monday lunchtimes. Last week, Dr. Jane Williams and Neil McGregor reflected on Botticelli's mystic nativity. If you missed that seminar, you can watch it on the Abbey's YouTube channel. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jennifer Slivka and Professor Ben Quash, both from King's College London, an institution with which the Abbey has a long and happy partnership. They will discuss Giovanni Bellini's Madonna del Prato, the Madonna of the Meadow. It's a thrill to have Jennifer and Ben with us today. Jennifer, over to you. So I'm going to start talking about this painting, which was just introduced, Giovanni Bellini's Madonna del Prato, which he must have painted in Venice between about 1500 and 1505. Giovanni Bellini lived and worked in Venice all his life. Born into the leading dynasty of Venetian painters, over the course of his 65 year career, he became celebrated for his pioneering portrayal of natural light, for his monumental altarpieces, and perhaps above all, for his smaller, tender paintings of the Virgin and Child, such as this one, which were made as devotional images, often for the domestic interior. Bellini completed this work at the height of his artistic career, around 1505, around the same time that the famous German painter Albrecht Dürer was visiting Venice and noted, quote, Giovanni is very old, and yet he's the best painter of all. A statement well attested by this work, and one that means quite a lot coming from one of the most, if not the most, talented painters working north of the Alps in this period. Like many artists, Bellini was very much a product of the social, cultural, spiritual, and geographic environment he grew up in, and his early works in particular are indebted to the Byzantine mosaics and icons in his city. A city which to this day, in which to this day, they are a visual reminder of the long-standing relationship between the Venetian Republic and the Byzantine Empire until its fall in 1453. Broadly speaking, Bellini's paintings of the 1460s and 70s, so predating this work, often referenced the more static, frontal, and stylized compositions characteristic of Byzantine works. And as an example of those artworks dating more or less to the 1460s by Giovanni Bellini, I couldn't resist but show you this beautiful work now in the Pinacoteca di Brera in Milan, known as the Greek Madonna. And she's got that name because not only does she seem to emulate these Greek Byzantine icons, but there's also Greek inscriptions at the upper left and right of that cloth of honor above her. In particular, Bellini's many representations of the Virgin standing or seated at a parapet before a cloth of honor and either holding the infant Christ in her arms or supporting him on the ledge in front of her seem to refer back to an icon tradition, all the while infusing it with a new naturalism and tenderness. Bellini departs from those familiar works quite dramatically in the Madonna of the Meadow. And one wonders if it was, in part at least, due to the demands of an unknown patron of this work. Here, Bellini sets the Virgin and Child in a beautifully rendered field, with a landscape receding into the distance. The horizontal format also marks a shift from his more common vertical format, as you've just seen, and more Byzantine inflected style. At the time of its creation, this work would have been striking for its near unprecedented use of a naturalistic landscape. Bellini being one of the first Italian painters to situate his sacred subjects within natural settings as a means of amplifying a particular meaning or more often, as I'll argue, to suggest different layers of meaning. The lush meadow in which the sacred figures are seated is bordered by a strip of barren terrain beyond which cultivated land and a small hill town are visible. The landscape would have appeared familiar to those from the flat, alluvial, mainland provinces of Venice, 
you may have also recognized the foothills of the Alps rising in the distance. Rather than presenting the Christ child to the view as she often does, here the Virgin takes up a very different posture, seated on the ground in the grassy meadow, adoring the sleeping child in her lap. In representing the Virgin as seated, not on a throne as we often see her depicted, but directly on the ground, Bellini was drawing on a much earlier, in fact, a 14th century visual tradition known as the Madonna of Humility. This iconographic type was intended to underscore both the humble and the extraordinarily exalted role of the Virgin as the mother of Christ. The child, as we've seen, more traditionally represented standing, sitting, or making a gesture of blessing, is here instead shown naked and asleep. With his eyes closed and his limbs akimbo, he appears to be in a deep slumber. His pose calls to mind a type of picture that would have been well known to contemporary viewers. A lamentation, as it's known in English, a Vesperbild in German, or a Pietà, as it's described in Italian which shows the Virgin Mary lamenting over the dead body of Christ laid across her lap. This subject, which is very subtly, I think, signaled here, is one Bellini would return to more explicitly uh, immediately after completing this work, the Madonna of the Meadow, in his Pietà of 1506, which is now in the Academia in Venice. And I'm very thankful to my colleagues in Venice for sending me this beautiful photograph. Interestingly, although this iconography would become one of the most represented scenes in Christian art, there is no reference to this particular moment in the Gospels. It is instead an imagined visualization of a period after the crucifixion and deposition and before the entombment. The English term lamentation obviously refers to the Virgin mourning over the body of her son, but the Italian term pietà and unfortunately there's no neat translation of this term in English, offers broader semantic possibilities. And I'll explain what I mean about that. Chita in the Italian can refer to an emotional state of both piety and pity, or be applied to other devotional images. And here I'm thinking images of the Imago Chitatis, the Man of Sorrows, or other representations of the dead Christ, for example, supported by angels. Indeed, without direct reference to the biblical text, these pietà, these piety, pity images, exist perhaps not as a single moment within a longer narrative, but rather outside of an earthly or rational conception of time. Such devotional images were purposely designed as aids for prayer or contemplation. In German, they even have a specific name. They're known as Andachsbilder and show holy figures extracted from a narrative context to form a highly focused and often very emotional vignette. I mention all of these very specific uh, art historical terms, lamentation, pietà, uh, Vesperbild, Andachsbild here, because I think they can help us think about what type of image Bellini's Madonna of the Meadow is, and therefore what it can and is intended to do. While most would not describe it as a lamentation, I would argue it is a pietà of sorts, and also an andacht's build, an image not entirely unlike an icon that stands outside of time, an idea I'll return to towards the end of this talk. At first glance, the virgin and child appear to sit fully and convincingly within the landscape. Upon further consideration, however, it becomes clear that this harmonious and natural seeming composition is achieved through deeply skilled artistic manipulation. The virgin is rendered in a particularly grand scale and forms an almost perfect equilateral triangle at the base and foreground of the picture and she becomes a pyramidal support, an anchor for the figure of Christ, the Christ child in her lap. The vividness of her blue mantle stands out against the greens, greys and browns of the landscape and extends the entire width of the composition, as if to remind the viewer that she's not only the Madonna of humility, as I've just described, 
but also the sedes sapientiae, the throne or seat of wisdom. This Latin epithet for the Virgin and the iconography it refers to is meant to draw attention to her status as the vessel in which the Holy Child was born. Indeed, here the child is entirely contained, almost enfolded within the drapery of his mother's mantle over her lap and his body does not extend beyond hers, a subtle reference perhaps to the womb from which he issued. The Virgin presses gently her fingertips together in a gesture of prayer that forms an oval shape which echoes the shape of her face and hairline, while the tilted angle of her head mirrors the curve of her right hand. The effect of this mirroring suggests that it's not only her hands but her entire body that composes the prayer. Bellini places the Virgin within the landscape so that her body appears entirely, almost entirely associated with the earth and with only her head and shoulders rising above it, silhouetted against the blue sky. Indeed, her connection to the landscape is underscored by the way the line of her right shoulder, so if we look to our left, and neck seem to extend naturally from the gentle rise of a hill in the left back background, giving way at the height of her head so that the light sky appears like a natural halo. So she's like an extension of that landscape. Similarly, the fluffy atmospheric clouds are carefully arranged so as to perform or so as to form a kind of crown around her head. Everywhere in this composition, nature recognizes and serves the divine. The detailed minutiae of Bellini's landscapes invites the beholder in, encourages them to appreciate each figure, tree, animal and edifice, and then to step back and try and puzzle each piece back into the whole. At the far left, for example, a large vulture, typically a portent of death, perches at the top of a bare tree amid a copse of barren trees. This bird appears to observe another, perhaps a crane, on the ground which has raised its wings in reaction and retaliation to a snake. This peculiar detail has been traced to the famous pastoral odes written by the Roman poet Virgil, a literary allusion suggesting this work was made for a particularly educated client, and is perhaps a reference to good as embodied by the white bird versus evil, which is typically symbolized by the snake. Beyond them, cattle and their herders are working the land, or in the case of this detail, resting from their toils. On the right hand side of the Virgin, a bit more activity is occurring. And the light in this picture emanates from the upper left and has a particularly pale silvery quality which combined with the ploughing of the empty fields and the sprouting of foliage on the delicate poplars in the distance, all suggest spring is about to arrive. However, as the barren trees of the left foreground suggest, it has not arrived yet. Nevertheless, preparations have begun for the Earth's emergence from a period of deep sleep or even death to a period of renewed life. Similarly, the painting seems to encourage us to look forward to the reawakening of the sleeping infant Christ, and in as much as it alludes to the Pietà, to the resurrection of the dead Christ, as well as to the subsequent commemoration and celebration of this event at Easter. The monumental scale of the sacred figures here, and their location as if pushed right up against the front of the picture plane, make them simultaneously appear to be a part of, but also somehow outside or detached from the landscape. Indeed, we see them both within and against a Venetian landscape, one complete with an anachronistic Renaissance city that would have looked familiar to Bellini's contemporaries and would have transported this sacred scene into their own backyard, so to speak. Accordingly, the artist may be seen to be bringing the event forward and into the viewer's own space and time. Alternatively, perhaps it is we, the beholders of this painting today, who are transported back in time, be that to 16th century Venice, or further back still, 
as witnesses to the Virgin Mary in adoration of her newborn child. In his great skill in absorbing and transforming the lessons of his artistic predecessors, Bellini presents the Virgin and Child here in a radically new way, with an increased naturalism and tenderness, and with a plethora of meanings and rich associations that refer beyond the single image or moment. In this way, we might describe Bellini as creating a new, entirely westernized notion of an icon in a scene that occurs both out of time and perhaps for all time. Well, I want to reflect a little on folds and um, picking up on something that Jennifer mentioned in passing, which is that um, two things actually. One is that uh, the way in which Giovanni Bellini depicts this landscape is a very layered, in a very layered way. So there's a sense of um, many, many different receding planes within the picture, but also a, a layering within it of meaning. Um, and she also talked about how the infant Christ is enfolded in Mary's uh, magnificently blue garment and also in a certain way in, in her lap, which creates a, a, a sort of natural cradle for the infant Jesus. Um, Giovanni Bellini, it seems to me, is a master of folds, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But it seems to me that in this um, sensitivity to the foldedness of reality, he um, is attuned to something that's true of our world in general. In other words, there's a sort of metaphysical quality to this appreciation of the foldedness of reality. We live in a world of folds. Our countryside, perhaps especially in ancient places of ancient settlement, uh, like the British Isles, is a landscape of foldedness, with the possible exception of the fens from where I address you, which are rather too flat to have too many folds. But uh, even our capital city, where uh, where Jamie is is um, hosting us from, uh, London, is an extraordinarily folded city. I take classes of undergraduates around it every year, not not least to visit Westminster Abbey when we can. And one of the startling things that they very quickly notice is that London is still a very densely layered network of alleyways and cuts and roads with twists and bends as quirky as their names. And the rationalist city planners of the late 17th century, even though they had what looked like an opportunity to rebuild something more like Paris or Berlin, something on a grid plan with boulevards and right angled corners uh, found that they couldn't. Ancient property rights, also a whole set of sort of interleaving uh, sets of claims upon the land um, meant that the workshops and guild halls all had to be put back on the old footprint and according to the original pattern. And so London has stayed as dense and mysterious as ever. Great handmade London as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle called it. And there is something unreal about the wholly rationalized order of the grid-like machine-made city. It seeks maximum transparency and predictability, but to me it also feels like a vain attempt to organize the seething and vital energies of urban life, which are in the end the seething and vital energies of the human heart too. London is truer to what the world is really like, and so I think is Giovanni Bellini in his very different context. So is his vision of the world. He too understands that transparency is not everything and that the vital energies which make the world what it is are things that are folded within the world and that take time to uncover or indeed to, to await the disclosure of. Much of what I want to say um, is I have to acknowledge uh, at the outset is acknowledge both to what Jennifer has said and also to the work of uh, the art historian Paul Hills, who's uh, Professor Emeritus at the Courtauld Institute and has written very beautifully on the foldedness of uh, Bellini's uh, work um, in the context of a book called Veiled Presences. And what I'd like to do if I can is to show you um, the second slide it's a very peculiar image because what we have is uh, a Christ who's clearly awake and uh, alert 
um, and yet still oddly wearing the crown of thorns. And uh, the marks of the wounds of his crucifixion are in his hands, and you can see the slit in his side from the lance. So this is a Christ, uh, oddly, who seemed to be not yet the Christ of the resurrection, and yet not, not dead either. Um, it's referred to as Christ's blessing. The title it's acquired is Christ's blessing. And this uh, painting is in the Louvre in Paris. Um, but what Paul Hills particularly wants to draw attention to here is the extraordinary attention that Bellini has uh, devoted to the uh, to the um, foldedness of the garment that Christ is wearing. These fluted column like falls of cloth um, in this tunic that he's wearing. Very, very beautifully, exquisitely rendered um, to such a degree that Paul Hill speculates there's a sense in Bellini's painterly treatment of these folds of a sense that they are metaphorically um, eloquent of something about Christ himself. And in particular, he picks up the fact that the, um, the wound in Christ's breast, because it's a very unusually high up this wound, just beneath his nipple, um, is itself um, as giving us a sense of the foldedness of Christ's very flesh. Um, there's a, a rent in the garment and a further rent in the body. And we get the sense of layering that I was talking about a minute ago, the layering of clothing, then of body, and then the, the hint of a further, as it were, recession within the body of Christ itself. Possibly this is a point of entry within the fold of flesh that's created almost as though under a female breast. Um, and there is a long tradition in Christian mysticism of thinking of Christ's uh, uh, wounds in terms that, are, that draw analogies uh, with the female body and the nourishing breast of Christ is a frequent image in that connection. The breast that feeds us, the blood that feeds us from Christ's side connected with the nourishing milk of the mother. So we have here a sense of a progression that's possible uh, through the various foldedness, the various folds, if you like, of Christ's clothing and then of his body. Now, with that in mind, we might return to our image of uh, the Madonna del Prato and wonder about the fact that this Christ has no clothing at all, unlike Bellini's uh, peculiar Christ, but in that strange state between uh, crucifixion and resurrection. This Christ uh, is without clothing. And yet, as Paul Hill says, there is nevertheless a veil to be encountered here, the veil of flesh. And that's something that Jamie himself drew out two weeks ago in uh, an earlier uh, seminar in this series. The fact that the veil, that the veil of the temple, the veil of the Jewish temple, um, which was torn in two at the moment of the crucifixion of Christ, is associated in Christian tradition, and perhaps especially in the letter to the Hebrews, uh, is associated with Christ's flesh. Christ's flesh is compared with the veil of the temple. It, like the veil, is torn in the course of the crucifixion. Um, but um, at the same time, it's a communicative veil. It's a veil which doesn't just conceal, but reveals. And of course, the word veil is contained in those two words, etymologically, both uh, the word revelation is the same as the word for un unveiling. So Christ's emerging from his enfoldedness within the womb of Mary is a revelation, an unveiling. And yet part of what we encounter in this unveiling of Christ is the veil of his flesh. One of the things we perhaps easily forget in uh, our world in which veils are diaphanous. Um, in other words, we tend to think of them as things you can more or less see through, is that the diaphanous veil was not the sort of veil that uh, St. Paul would have written about when he talked about uh, being having unveiled faces, um, nor indeed the sort of veil that would have hung in the temple um, as the at the entrance of the Holy of Holies in the temple. Veils were very thick, Things and often impenetrable to the human eye. Um, and yet, even then, I think early, early thinkers and early theologians didn't see them as only barriers in need of being torn down or ripped apart, even though, as I say, the veil of the temple 
in Jerusalem, which concealed the place of God's most intense presence, uh, reserved for the sole access of the high priest just once a year, was indeed torn from top to bottom. But veils, as many early Christian theologians commented, are not just barriers. They are, um, even before becoming translucent or diaphanous, they're often mediating structures. Pseudo Dionysus affirms that the divine ray can enlighten us only by being upliftingly concealed in a variety of sacred veils, which the providence of the Father adapts to our nature as human beings. The divine ray can enlighten us only by being upliftingly concealed in a variety of sacred veils. This is a concealment that is at the same time a form of enlightenment. The veils, which perhaps are necessary for our protection, are at the same time active, a concession to our imperfect nature, but active in expressing God's love for human beings. Veils, clothes and coverings open themes not just of divine ineffability, but of divine providence as well. Let me give an example of how this can work on a big scale as well as on a small scale, and indeed can confuse the clear distinction between big and small. And here too, I'm grateful to Paul Hills. There are only two times in the Bible where the word swaddling occurs. It's a description of what Mary does to her infant son, Jesus, as we know, the divine saviour who has taken flesh to himself. But it's also what the creator God of immense power, who is described for us in the book of Job, does to the very oceans themselves. Who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? This is the voice of God speaking. When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it. God, in other words, in the act of creation, swaddles the oceans themselves, both to contain them and make flourishing possible around them, to contain their chaos and therefore make life possible. Again, a concession uh, through this swaddling, this act of swaddling, a concession to the flourishing of a world that perhaps cannot um, survive the full unleashing of the power of divine creation untrammeled. Paul Hills also discusses a 13th century panel of the virgin and swaddled child, unlike uh, Giovanni Bellini's child here, um, that was uncovered in a manger each year in the context of a mystery play at Christmas time in Padua Cathedral. Um, and a small drama would have been enacted in the cathedral in the context of this Christmas mystery play in which two of the cathedral clergy would have approached two other uh, people playing the parts uh, of the angel, uh, of the of the midwives at the manger um, and they were acting the parts of the shepherds and asked the midwives um, where the sign was that the angels had told them to come and seek and at that point the midwives in inverted commas would produce this wrapped painted icon of the Christ child unwrapped it before their eyes and before the eyes of those in the cathedral who could see it, uh, but precisely in that unwrapping would have uh, disclosed the figure of a child swaddled. So in other words, there is fold within fold, layer within layer. In Paul Hills's words, as the image is unveiled, what is revealed is the veiled child. And that parallel between the swaddling by Virgin Mary of the Christ child and the swaddling by the creator of the world itself highlights the Virgin's simultaneous connection to and distance from her child as microcosm to macrocosm, as a reflection, if you like, of the creation's relationship with its creator, creator who is nearer to us than our own breath, as Mary is uniquely intimate with Christ, his heart having beaten within her body until the moment of his birth, uh, and yet and yet worships him, as we see here in her hands, which create a sort of cupola or canopy above his head, worships him as her redeemer too. 
in both levels, God's relationship to creation, which he swaddles, and Mary's relationship to Christ, we get a sense of both intimacy and ultimacy. These paradoxical relationships, which are suited to the mystery of the divine, who becomes incarnate among us in matter. But as I say, here the veil is Christ's simple flesh, no swaddling bands at all. Um, and here too, though, I think we're invited to look further, to look deeper, to look beyond this flesh and to seek um, the full meaning of this Christ child who has been unveiled to us by his mother. Paul Hills writes that as drapery is to the body, so the body is to the spirit. This is a world in which things are analogically nested, if you like, one within another. Drapery moves over the body as the body moves, writes Paul Hills, and suddenly we're helped to imagine the body's animation by the spirit in a new way too. Because the body of Christ wasn't just a veil behind which God was hiding. And it wasn't just a useful vehicle for getting the work of Jesus's active ministry accomplished. Jesus's body wasn't just the medium by which he delivered his message, the good news of the kingdom, after which it could be consigned to the rubbish dump of history. In central respects, Jesus's body was and is the message, or at least his body enfolds eloquently the self-communication of God, whose unfolding to us in love is our creation and our salvation. The language of the human body, it turns out, is God's language of preference for telling us about God's self. The 15th century theologian Nicholas of Cusa developed the categories of enfoldedness and unfoldedness to describe the creation's relation to God. In its enfoldedness, we learn that the creation originates from within God's heart, so to speak, just as the Christ child originates within Mary's womb. And indeed, the creation is eternally enfolded in God, in as much as God is eternal and creation has always been in the mind of God. But in its being made, with its temporal as well as its spatial elements, the creation is unfolded. And once unfolded, creation can then come into a new relationship with God, which is not simply a return to enfoldedness, a sort of reabsorption. It's precisely a new relationship. And this is what Nicholas of Cusa explores in a third stage beyond enfoldedness and unfoldedness, and which he calls sometimes union. Christ is the one in whom this union is made possible. And to use the Latin words that are Nicholas of Cusa's original words, we encounter God's activity in creation and revelation as an implicatio, that's an enfoldedness, from which our English word implication is derived, followed by an explicatio, an explication, an unfolding, which in turn achieves a complicatio, which doesn't just mean complication in our modern sense of difficulty, but precisely that union, that infolding, if I can play, we don't have an exact word, but if I can play with that possibility, a folding within in which we become related to God in a new way as having our own integrity, but as in some way newly brought into intimacy with God to use words uh, that mean the same things but have slightly different resonance, we encounter a threefold dynamic of covering, uncovering, and finally, in that word complicatio, discovering. Bellini, I think, is a master of discovery. He has shown us here not only a Christ uncovered, but a Christ who invites discovery, who invites us to enter into a closer proximity to his body, just as that image of the Christ blessing after his crucifixion challenges us to, to an intimacy with his body, which may indeed be somewhat alarming to draw near to that wound, which is at the same time the source of nourishment and life. 
And as Jennifer has said, the death-like quality of this sleeping infant is a reminder to us, lest we forget it, that even in this first moment of unveiling, the deeper call, the deeper mystery of the fact that our journey towards union with God can only take place by way of Christ's death, by way of the cross, uh, is encoded here, is folded, if you like, within this painting, is part of the discovery which we must undertake if we're to relate to and understand this painting fully. I want to say one final thing as we think about folds, um, and that's, if you like, uh, an ethical, to make an ethical point. Part of what is um, shown to us in the whole course of Christ's life, which begins here at this moment of birth, is, um, is a journey which encourages us to become Christ-like. Um, and part of the way in which we become Christ-like is to take our place, if you like, within the circle of foldedness, the reciprocal intimacy of God with us, inviting us in turn to be with God and in that journey with each other. Um, what we see here is a Christ who has been enfolded within Mary's body. What we see much later in Christ's life on the night before his crucifixion is a Christ who enfolds his disciples. Here another andas bill to pick up a word that Jennifer used, um, an image of Christ with John, the beloved disciple, at the Last Supper, leaning in close and resting his head on Christ's breast, uh, being enfolded within Christ's embrace in an extraordinary intimacy. The Christ once enfolded in Mary's body now enfolds his disciples in his and invites a similar sort of abiding, a similar sort of rest as he once enjoyed in the fold of Mary's lap. Christ will soon die, as Bellini anticipates in his painting, and when that happens, we're told by the Gospels, by John's Gospel in particular, that a further folding will happen, the folding of Mary in the arms of John. The Christ who was enfolded in Mary's body enfolds John in his at the Last Supper, and then at his departure, John enfolds the body of the woman who once enfolded Christ's. The circle is complete, the fold is made, and we are brought within that fold too, challenged to look for ways in which we can enfold one another in a time in particular when that's very difficult physically for us to do. It's a thing of great poignancy, I think, and something we rightly long for as we look for a time when once again we can take our place in this enfolded and enfolding reality. Uh, let us pray. God, our Redeemer, who prepared the Blessed Virgin Mary to be the mother of your Son, grant that as she looks for his coming as our Saviour, so we may be ready to greet him when he comes again as our Judge, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. Our very sincerest thanks to Jennifer and Ben for two magnificently inspiring presentations and to all of the other art historians and theologians who have been involved in this project during Advent. Thanks to you for joining us. The four seminars will be available to watch again on Westminster Abbey's YouTube channel. If you've enjoyed the series you can make a donation to the Abbey's mission and work via our website and we're very grateful for all levels of support. As we continue with restrictions and uncertainty due to this virus, as we're unable to enfold one another physically or even gather um, in large numbers, we assure you of our prayers for you and for those you love this Christmas. We ask you to remember us here. May God richly bless you and enfold you in his love this Christmas tide.